Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, whatever time you're watching this. Uh, happy 2023, as I'm recording this, it's the 2nd of January and my second day out on a bike this year. Um, as you'll see, I'm on a Royal Enfield Himalayan, but I'm not actually going to be talking about that bike today. I'll only review a bike once I've owned it and had it for a few years and done some miles on it. The Himalayan's only got 2,000 miles on it so far, so I'm not looking at that one today. Instead, I'm going to look at something that uh, used to be in my garage, but isn't anymore because it got traded in. Owned for 44,000 miles in seven years, we have the Suzuki Gladius. It's the first Suzuki and the first V-Twin I've owned. It has a 650cc engine, which is really nice to ride. Lots of low-down torque. As you can see, the fuel economy from the column on the right compares better than the Honda CB500 or the 900 Hornet, which are in the other columns. The 900 Hornet is the Honda 919 in the US. Round town, it's uh, very nice to ride. Low down weight, low seat height, uh, enough room on the pegs and nice wide bars so you don't feel cramped. And uh, it's uh, quite easy to poodle about on, even at slow speed you can pull off more or less go straight into a full lock u-turn with a little bit of practice and experience out of town the bike is really nice on the twisties you can flick it from side to side with ease uh, motorway cruising speeds aren't a problem if you're used to riding naked bikes one problem, the pegs go down really, really easily. I was actually looking at uh, taking the hero blobs off these. You can see they're very long and do touch the ground quite easily. I lifted the right hand peg up and then promptly hit the exhaust on the deck. So that's why I left them on. Um, the previous film shows that the side stand would be going down next. The mirrors are awful show your shoulders so extenders are put on you can see it makes the bike look a bit gawky but uh, i'd rather have good mirrors the instruments are nice and clear fairly basic which is what i like you've got a taco speedo few idiot lights and you cycle through two trips a fuel reserve a clock and the auto showing just over 44,000 miles the plastic tank things are a bit strange and seem pointless until you're clumsy and knock it over against the garage wall as I did here. So uh, I was glad of them despite hating them to start with. A neat Suzuki touch is the ignition switch. If you pull the key almost all the way out, you can actually turn the top part around so that it looks like it's either on steering lock or to stop the rain getting in or to stop anybody drilling the lock out. So it's a nice little touch from Suzuki. The chain looks like it belongs on a push bike <coughs> I'll be honest um, I looked at this and thought that's not going to last long it lasted 14 and a half thousand miles and only got changed because I ride year round some of the links were starting to seize you notice on the swing arm though that there isn't actually anything in the way of a wear marker for the chain normally you get a small sticker showing new and replace but not on Suzuki there is a really strange measurement you have to take, which is 200 and something point something millimetres uh, across 21 tra uh, chain pitches or chain pins, sorry. And I made up a tool for this because I had access to a man who had some thread, some small nuts and a vernier gauge that I could set the right measurement on. So I set the... Uh, join between the nuts at the appropriate distance, lock tighted it all together and then had a tool to measure the chain with which wouldn't be needed if you actually had a little sticker and a pointer on the swing arm um, which most other bike manufacturers produce. It's not the only thing I don't like about the Suzuki by the way. Things I do like, the brakes are budget stroke value engineered they do work very well, not that you use them much with a V-twin engine, but the trouble is, as you can see, everything goes rusty apart from the engine and the frame. These are not good things to see on a bike that's only a few years old. Um, the downpipes look terrible, but they're actually still solid, um, no holes in them. Even the Givy luggage goes rusty. Givy in Daventry actually had me pop in with this and they took some photos to send up to their technical department because the finish was really bad. Headlight. 
Mm. You'll see that on this headlight, there isn't a centre reflector. There's a very good reason for that. It's the third headlight I've had on this bike. The first one, I thought I was starting to get weird things going wrong with my vision at night because it looked like the side of the headlight beam was shaking. But when I looked directly at where it, the, the verge was, I couldn't see that. <coughs> um, turns out that the headlight reflector vibrates loose after a couple of years and then we'll burn the as we're looking at it here the bottom right hand part of the reflector where you'll just see it go black then you need to replace the headlight first one was done under warranty second one i had to pay for myself and this is the mark three and you'll see from the uh, Fowler's website that you're going to be paying 300 quid for one of these. So if you've got one with a uh, black headlight or blackening headlight where the reflector's burning off and a loose centre reflector, budget that into the price if you're looking at buying one. A uh, few other annoying things. The rear brake reservoir is under the bodywork. Might be nice from a look at it isn't it pretty point of view but when you come to change the brake fluid you have to strip bits off the back end of the bike. Pretty poor design. And uh, talking of things that are really bad design. <coughs> the number plate bulb went. Um, looking underneath you can see there aren't any screws to get into this and um, to say it's a bit of an annoying job is a massive understatement you have to strip the back of the bike um, the seat coming off is the first thing then you've got to take these four bolts out these would actually have the grab handle if it wasn't for the uh, luggage that i've got on it then you have to take the two pins out for the bodywork and then you have to disconnect the seat lock uh, cable as I have luggage on my bike, all that has to come off as well. The uh, fixings here would be where the indicators would be mounted without the luggage. They would have to come off. Then the uh, joining bar either end has to be taken off because it runs under the back rack where you put the, put the side pannier mountings on. And then you go underneath and crawl around on the floor taking off a load of bolts under here to dismantle the back end of the bike that's left. Uh, the tail light hole assembly has to come off and be disconnected. Then the small pod with the indicators and the reflector and number plate light assembly have to come off as well, just to replace a bulb. So on this diagram, the three parts on the right actually have to be removed from the bike. I can't even see how this would make sense for a, an assembly line process because it's so fiddly difficult and annoying to try and fit get any of these uh, refitted it took me two and a half hours to do this and i'm quite happy twiddling spanners and i've been doing it a long time on bikes by contrast a cb 500 first released in 93 or 94 the tail light bulb actually illuminates the number plate from uh, a clear patch underneath and has two screws securing it nice easy job if you need to 900 Hornet, separate tail light bulb, again two screws to get into there and replace the tail light bulb. Uh, a three or four minute job and that includes him buying the bulb. Royal Enfield Himalayan LED tail light. Uh, come on Suzuki, you should have had a look at this and either made it easier or used an LED tail light. Um, you shouldn't have to go through four pages of a Haynes manual to look at which bits you have to strip out and put back together again just to replace a tail light bulb. That's really, really poor engineering and should never be done. Um, other things, the bike is very, very fragile. Aside from the um, difficulties of replacing anything, the shoddy headlight, the um, poor quality of finish on the, the fixings and some other parts of the bike, such as the exhaust, I dropped the Gladius um, about four miles an hour, certainly about walking pace coming out of a Ford, bent the handlebars. That's why you see silver, not black ones in this, uh, to get replacement handlebars for it. Um, broke a foot peg and also bent the link for the gear change, which meant it wouldn't, couldn't change gear. Luckily, somebody stopped who'd got a crowbar in the boot so I could bend it back into shape. Um, not very good build quality of drop bikes going 20 times faster than that on a track and just did a, a few little grazes on the bike to worry about and picked it up and then carried on riding so yeah the build quality and the fragile nature of the bike are pretty awful 
the other thing is the temperature gauge went um, sensibly you'd put this on the radiator so that it would actually measure the water temperature in their wisdom Suzuki buried the Gladius one between the throttle bodies it's a major headache and you actually have to remove the throttle bodies to get at the damn thing not that you can get one because two or three years after the bike was uh, released they stopped making the same part so you can get a replacement part for it I looked on the Fowler's website to try and find it I couldn't find it anywhere um, but there is a replacement out there if yours does go I found out mine had gone because the instruments lack a temperature gauge which is a bit of a bad thing on a water cooled bike I was riding through Exeter and the temperature was going through the roof I could smell the engine um, the fan hadn't come in so I turned up the bike let it cool down got home um, then um, checked everything out the fan was working the fuse was okay so the temperature gauge had to be replaced not a straightforward job that being said, what's it like on distance stuff? I've shown sort of a bit of country riding, a bit of town riding. Uh, painful in the extreme on the backside. You can ride them distances. I've done uh, 350 or so miles in a day. I've done 1,000 miles over three days. But you do feel like you've been caned. On the plank scale, this is a, a good four and a half out of five, where five is a plank with nails in it and the nails are pointing up. The seat is very, very uncomfortable. Um, normally they give after a bit, but after 40 odd thousand miles, still nothing. It was still a very, very uncomfortable bike to ride for serious distances. Another thing with year round riding that you'll find is that the head bearings need replacing with monotonous regularity. They have seals on them, uh, the top seal lets the water in, the bottom one keeps it there so that uh, you end up with rusty bearings. They feel very notchy and like the headstock's been welded so you're having to turn the bike through an imaginary hinge in the middle. Um, very annoying, the first set will go if you ride year round after about 15, 16,000 miles and uh, replacements, um, so aftermarket runs rather than Suzuki, you're looking at about 12 to 18 months with year-round riding, seven or 8,000 miles a year. So, to sum up, would I own another one? No, not for the sort of riding I do, and this bike has actually put me off owning a Suzuki full stop, uh, mainly due to the build quality on the very, very cheap parts they've used. It's a shame, the engine's great, handles really well, but it's just a pain to work on, not comfortable for distance, and for year-round riding, it tends to start rusting away. Um, I shouldn't say this on a modern bike. I'd have paid a grand more for it to actually be a good quality build and actually have a temperature gauge. Come on, you put a gear indicator on it. No, no, put a temperature gauge on. It's water-cooled. You need to know if your engine's getting overheated, apart from sitting in traffic and thinking, what's that funny smell? I know what a hot bike smells like, which is why I was able to stop and uh, let it cool down and limp it home. But yeah, if you're out for a, a Sunday blast with your mates, it's great. Um, chain will last God knows how long if you don't get it wet. Um, I adjusted it three times in 4, 14,000 miles. That's the longest lasting chain I've ever had. Um, it was nowhere near worn, it was just starting to seize up so I had to be replaced and I do look after my bikes. Um, yep, yeah, it's got good and bad parts for me, the bad far outweigh the good and I'd only give it 3 out of 10 for having to own one for the sort of riding that I do. But then I'm a high mileage year round rider um, so it's not suited for me unfortunately but if you don't do that sort of riding it is a really really fun bike to own. Or at least to ride. The owning side of it, a little bit different. Some of the jobs are easy to do. Changing the aisles a doddle. Don't look at anything at the back end of the bike if you ever need to change it though. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, honest view of uh, owning a Suzuki Gladius. Look either side of the Gladius. There was the SV650 and the SVR or SVF650. I think the Gladius is actually called an SVF. So look at the SVR. Um, 
I've had a look at one myself and a lot of the things that have annoyed me have actually been fixed on it. So looks like somebody at Suzuki had a look at it, had a think, scratched the head and got on with making it easier to work on. If you don't work on your bikes, that's fair enough. But remember, if it's harder to work on and it takes time to do, that's going to add up on your maintenance bill for uh, the time that the engineers and mechanics spend on it. So just remember that if you're looking at buying one of these. If you work on it yourself, some bits are easy, some bits are hard, some bits are insanely difficult. And uh, if you've got one, you will enjoy riding it. It is a hoot. Anyway, that's it for this review of the Gladius. There's going to be a 900 Hornet and a CB500 coming up when I get round to filming them. And um, hopefully you'll see those. And later this year, depending on the mileage that I get on them, there'll be the Tracer 9 and the Royal Enfield Himalayan reviews as well. Can hopefully catch you then. Finally, some thank yous. First of all, to Fowlers for their website. It's great if you're looking for spares. They use the manufacturer's blueprints and you can easily order parts from them. Then we have Shockwave Sound for the Scream. Hopefully it didn't scare you as much as I was scared when I saw how much of the bike I'd got to take apart to replace a blooming number plate uh, light bulb. And uh, NCH Software, who made the WavePad sound editing software that I used for putting the sound together on this. And there are links to these various sites down in the description below.